here we are in my study upstairs where I'm going to read a little from the very final section a conclusion to um, my new book Shaking All Over Popular Music and Disability this last couple of pages is a section called Shakings All Over and it starts with an epigraph from Sharon Snyder and David Mitchell from their book Cultural Locations of Disability. One of the primary tasks of disability studies is to cultivate media and textual critics who can intervene in the cultural images of disability that influence our responses and ways of imagining human differences. Well, I have volunteered myself to disability studies to contribute to this important task from my existing research field in cultural and popular music studies. The fresh dialogue here and elsewhere between disability studies and popular music can only enrich both. In A History of Disability, Henri Jacques Stiquet writes in passing of the idea of social contagion, that the love of difference and let us not even stretch love, but talk more modestly of simply the tolerance by the currently non-disabled of those with disabilities, could be socially contagious. What about cultural contagion? Stike continues, there is only one recourse beyond the ethical imperative, and that is to make it part of our culture. Sheila Riddell and Nick Watson put it more straightforwardly. The struggle for social justice then involves a quest for cultural recognition as well as economic redistribution. One of the aims of Shaking All Over has been to map the sonic history and tracks of that quest for cultural recognition. To discover that cultural expressions and explorations of disability have been the already heard of pop since its foundations were both established and shaken on day and night one, whenever they were. In his book about blindness and African-American music, Terry Roden shows us a cultural challenge for the disabled in pop and rock, for their musicians are performers in popular forms and thus the possibility for them to see their music making as a form of self-expression has always been tempered by the realisation of the economic necessity of attracting and entertaining normates. Failing the balance trick, I know that feeling, they become unpopular. Neil Young recalled in 1986 that his advisers used to urge him to keep all this weird polio stroke, epilepsy shit quiet. Among all the pop and rock in this book, there is a good deal of unpopular music. After all, in this chapter alone, we have seen the anti-star, the anti-star, a musical rough and readiness and anti-technique all employed within a disability context. But then we would do well to bear in mind the observation of Grail Marcus that to make true political music, you have to say what decent people don't want to hear. Shaken All Over argues for a pop that maintains a persistent and publicly profiled performativity in which the disabled body on stage demands rather than deflects a stare, in which pop's apparent ephemerality and consensus is compellingly destabilised by lyrics of the experiences of the disabled, and in which fans strategically employ pop discourse and its modes of behaviour to represent their impairment and to negotiate others' responses to it. Here I am thinking again of Ed Roberts, who, on returning to school after years of home education and bed rest following polio, saw his new schoolmates watching him being lifted from the car, suddenly thought of and felt like Elvis Presley, and so I decided to be a star, not a helpless cripple. Roberts reached for popular music, not as a compensation, not only as a cultural prosthetic, but as an attitude, a way of performing, of presenting the body and claiming the scene. And, according to Sondal and Auslander, 
Making the choice to perform his disability was the starting point of his life as an activist in the independent living movement. We can go further here than individual performance and think about the very act of people forming a band. From a disability perspective, the motivation for the formation and membership of a band may speak more of the desire for interdependence and community, whereby the band functions as support network and facilitation device, as well as being a collective space for cultural work. In the course of researching and writing the book, I have had the great pleasure, usually, of going to see artists and shows I thought relevant. A crip popper or rocker on stage, I'd be there in the audience, the one with the notebook. The evening that really stands out was a concert I'd never normally have gone to, since I'm a lover of mostly small interior music. It was a very expensive concert in a very large hall by a global superstar. The kind of gig where, if you have some sight, you screw up your eyes to see the key figure moving not on stage, but on the large screens either side of the stage. At least the sound, if you have some hearing, at such gigs is usually pretty good now nowadays. But you know what? I was totally blown away. I was moved. I was inspired. I was energised to get back to the book, to do the songs justice as far as I could, as well as to ensure that the critical politics and disability theory would not be lost in the close pop readings. And, looking back, I think I was reassured that my own experience of disability, charcot marie tooth disease, progressive muscular dystrophy, which, to be honest, had been doing my head in a bit, making me feel like Ian Dury's one-legged Peter, who knows bloody well he's got worse ever since he came in, was, straightforwardly put, livable with. Yes, I got all that from one pop gig. It still seems a lot to me, and on the way home I felt lucky. And this was from a pop star whose songs I had quite liked, rather than ever loved, who was there in my big sister's record collection when I was a 1970s teenager listening to prog and glam rock, then Kevin Coyne, then Ian Dury and the Pistols. It was when the superstar... I am not super cripping here, believe me, though I fear you will think I am. I don't think I am anyway. Maybe I am. I am. Reclaim the super crip from abjection or overcriticality. It was when the superstar moved from singing his extraordinary back catalogue and talking about the history and legacy of the civil rights movement to one simple direct statement spoken between songs, hmm, so not sung, about the personal experience of disability, the rights of the disabled and the demand for greater access and social mobility through urban design for all people with disabilities and 16,000 audience members cheered massively. I wasn't in that moment thinking about Stevie Wonder as freak or wonder, nor even as, in Rodin's term, a prosthetically enhanced and up-to-date cyborgian soul man. I wasn't thinking about the braille lettering on some of the album covers or the classic album's resonant names for a blind man, talking book, inner visions, that seemed to confirm the cliché of blindness and in music as offering, in Strauss's term, an enhanced interiority. Nor did I even have in mind the sonic urban painting that was living for the city. At the press launch in 1973, Wonder had all the journalists blindfolded on a tour around New York, though I had danced joyously to that song already that evening. Nor the later experimental film soundtracks. The blind guy doing the film music? Pushing the boundaries of cross-media collaboration. No. It was not these critical items in my mind then, at my pop concert, where I was being a fan. It was really the quite specific spoken demand for disability and awareness and access 
delivered on stage by the disabled musician at his pop concert, and the way that that utterance had been so cheered by everyone that powerfully struck me. The shaking's not all over, is it? The world still needs shaking up. Stevie told me that one night in Manchester, and I agree with him.